Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devgan, your physiology faculty, and this is the daily quiz series in the run-up to NEET PG 2025. Today I start with endocrinology and some miscellaneous topics in physiology, such as environmental physiology, exercise physiology, etc. So let's have a look at the questions in today's quiz. The first question says, a patient with a brain tumour learns that his pituitary stock has been affected. Secretion of which of the following hormones is most likely to increase after sectioning the pituitary stock? So a brief recap. The anterior pituitary hormones are regulated by hypothalamic hormones. There are some releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus. These releasing and inhibiting hormones, they enter into the hypothalamo hypophysial portal system. They go into the anterior pituitary and affect the secretion of the anterior pituitary hormones. What about the posterior pituitary? The two posterior pituitary hormones are ADH and oxytocin. Both of these are synthesized in the hypothalamus, then transported by axoplasmic transport into the posterior pituitary and then they enter into the circulation. So ADH and oxytocin undergo what is known as a neurosecretion. Now, let's have a look at which are the hypothalamic hormones regulating the secretion of the anterior pituitary. So the first one is CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, which increases the secretion of adrenocorticotrophic hormone from the anterior pituitary. Thyrotropin releasing hormone increases the secretion of thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, increases the secretion of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone releasing hormone increases the secretion of growth hormone. An inhibiting hormone, somatostatin, can also affect the growth hormone secretion, but somatostatin will reduce the growth hormone secretion. But please remember, out of the two, it is GHRH which is more important. There is another inhibiting hormone which is called prolactin inhibiting factor, which is nothing but dopamine, which inhibits the secretion of prolactin from the anterior pituitary. So if the pituitary stalk is sectioned, all hormones will be reduced, including the posterior pituitary hormones, except one. One hormone will show an increase and that is prolactin because prolactin is being regulated by a prolactin inhibiting factor. If I remove that, prolactin secretion will increase. Which of the following is correct about oxytocin? So oxytocin is synthesized in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. The two important hypothalamic nuclei involved in the synthesis of the posterior pituitary hormones, supraoptic and paraventricular. ADH is mainly synthesized in supraoptic, oxytocin mainly in paraventricular nucleus. Now, is this hormone responsible for galactokinesis? Kinesis is movement, galacto here refers to milk. So yes, it is responsible for the milk let down reflex or also known as milk ejection. Oxytocin will cause contraction of the myoepithelial cells surrounding the ducts in the mammary glands resulting in milk ejection, that is galactokinesis. So this is true. It can be given orally? Definitely not. Oxytocin is a peptide hormone. If given orally, it will be digested. It is secreted by the anterior pituitary? No, this is secreted by the posterior pituitary. In higher doses, it exerts a diuretic-like effect. This is false. Definitely is not a diuretic. So the answer to this question is it is responsible for galacto. Kinesis. There is another term which is called galactopoiesis, that is synthesis of milk. The hormone responsible for milk synthesis and therefore secretion is 
prolactin. Prolactin increases the synthesis of milk proteins, especially casein. So that is galactopoiesis. A 35-year-old lady is diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and has a positive antibody titer against thyroid peroxidase enzyme. Which of the following is not a function of the affected enzyme? Requires thyroid peroxidase. What is coupling? Diidotyrosine plus diidotyrosine forms T4. Diidotyrosine plus monoidotyrosine forms T3. These are coupling reactions and they require the presence of thyroid peroxidase. Oxidation of iodine, I- minus is converted to I2. This is in the presence of the enzyme thyroid peroxidase. Organification of iodine, what is organification? Iodine is added to tyrosine to form monoido and diido tyrosine. This also requires thyroid peroxidase. So the first three options definitely require thyroid peroxidase. The one which does not require thyroid peroxidase is iodide trapping. A brief look at iodide trapping. This is a follicle. These are the thyroid cells. Here is the blood. The most important function of the thyroid cells is iodide trapping. How does iodine enter into the cells? It is via Sodium iodide symport, which is an example of secondary active co-transport. Once iodine enters into the cells, it now has to go into the colloid because all the synthesis of enzymes takes place in the colloid. How does it enter into the colloid? This is via another protein, which is called I minus CL minus exchanger. This is an example of anion exchange. What is anion exchange? There is a mutual exchange of anions based on the concentration gradients. I minus goes from the cell into the colloid. Chloride CL minus comes from the colloid into the cell. So this protein is an anion exchanger. This anion exchanger or the I minus Cl minus exchanger, this is also known as pendrin. So two important questions here. How does iodine come from the blood into the cell via the sodium iodide symbol? How does the iodine go from the cell into the colloid? This is via I minus Cl minus exchanger or which of the following hormones does not need a second messenger? The only one which does not need a second messenger is IGF-1. It does not need a second messenger. Now, insulin and IGF-1 do not need a second messenger. The reason is because their receptors itself has tyrosine kinase Activity. Other hormones which do not require second messenger are growth hormone, prolactin, erythropoietin. These act via the JAK STAT pathway. So they also do not need a second messenger. ACTH, parathormone, glucagon, they use cyclic AMP as the second messenger. So the answer here is IGF-1. A diver is doing explorative work underwater at a depth of 200 feet below sea level. Which of the following are most likely to occur, occur sorry, after he makes a rapid ascent to the surface? Now, please understand when a diver is working underwater, the pressure, the surrounding pressure keeps on increasing. The deeper you go, the surrounding pressure will increase even more. For every 33 feet or 10 meters below sea level, the pressure increases by one atmosphere. Remember, at sea level, the pressure is one atmosphere. So every 33 feet that you go below sea level, the pressure will increase by one atmosphere. So what happens when the pressure increases? 
it now causes an increased solubility of gases and it also causes an increase in the density of gases. The deeper you go under water, the surrounding pressure keeps on increasing. Right? At a depth of about 200 feet, as I gave in the question, what is going to be the pressure? One atmosphere of sea level plus one at 33 feet, plus one at 66, plus one at 99, and so on. Uh, if you see this, it's four atmosphere at 100 feet and add another three, uh, about seven atmospheres at 200 feet. Very large increase in pressure. This increases the solubility of gases and increases their density, making it difficult to breathe. Gases tend to go in a dissolved state underwater. So if I'm giving the diver 100% oxygen, there is a risk of developing oxygen toxicity. What is oxygen toxicity? Now, because of an increased solubility underwater, there is going to be generation of free radicals. Which are these free radicals that we are talking about? O3 minus, H2O2, and they start producing cell damage. There are two categories of symptoms. There are some neurological symptoms and pulmonary symptoms. The neurological symptoms are called the BERT effect and the pulmonary symptoms are called Smith effect. CNS symptoms of oxygen toxicity are the BERT effect and the pulmonary symptoms are called the Smith effect. CNS symptoms can include twitching of muscles, facial pallor, there is vertigo, nausea, altered behavior, clumsiness, convulsions. All this is happening underwater. Pulmonary symptoms can be a carinal irritation, there is uncontrolled cough, there is chest pain, there is dyspnea, difficulty in breathing. These are known as the Smith effect. To reduce oxygen toxicity, I can give a combination of oxygen and an inert gas. And the inert gas that we normally use is nitrogen. So I give him, I reduce the percentage of oxygen and give him nitrogen. Now nitrogen is as it is a highly soluble gas. Underwater its solubility increases even more. So there is a huge increase in the nitrogen solubility, which starts dissolving in the plasma and even in the cell membranes and in the myelin. Because of that, it alters ionic conductivity and that results in a condition which is known as nitrogen narcosis. Please understand, in nitrogen narcosis, there is no chemical reaction. It's just a physical reaction where there is an increased solubility of or increased dissolution of nitrogen in not only the plasma, but also in the cell membranes and in the myelin. Altering ionic conductivity and gives it, giving rise to what is known as nitrogen narcosis. Now, why is it called narcosis? Because the symptoms of nitrogen narcosis are similar to alcohol intoxication. And sometimes this is also known as the martini effect. Martini is a cocktail. So it is as though the diver has been drinking cocktails as he has been going under water. So it's called the martini effect. He starts behaving like a drunkard. He starts laughing. He will start pulling his mask. So obviously, he's going to put his life at risk. So all these effects will be seen underwater, which are these oxygen toxicity, which includes the BERT effect and the Smith effect, nitrogen narcosis. Now, when, he, when the diver comes to the surface, and especially if he makes a very rapid ascent to the surface, remember, underwater, the gases were in a dissolved state. But when he comes to the surface, these gases start forming bubbles. And these bubbles will now cause air embolism. It is like when you open a can of Pepsi. When the can was closed, carbon dioxide is in a dissolved state. 
But the moment you open a bottle of Pepsi or a can of Pepsi, the, the carbon dioxide starts forming bubbles because there is a sudden release of pressure. This gives rise to what is known as the caissons disease, also known as decompression sickness, bends, aeroembolism, air embolism. All of these are because of gas emboli blocking blood vessels. The symptoms of caissons disease are bends. 90% of the patients will present with bends, painful joints and muscles. They can also be pulmonary symptoms, can also present with CNS symptoms, which include convulsions, coma, maybe even death. So let's go back to the question which I asked you. A diver doing explorative work underwater at a depth of 200 feet below sea level makes a rapid ascent, he is most likely to suffer from caissons disease. Oxygen toxicity, nitrogen narcosis, birth effect, smith effect, which are forms of oxygen toxicity, will all occur under water.